Welcome back to Parasitology Lecture Series. The topic for today is liver flukes. When you talk about liver flukes, you have to discuss the two major classifications. You have your fasciola and the clonorchis slash opistorchis groups. Please take note of the proper spelling for clonorchis and opistorchis, taking into consideration where the H's go. Liver flukes are found worldwide, usually in countries where sheep and cattle are primarily raised. Throughout the years, the incidence for liver flukes have been apparently increasing. In fact, fasciolysis, the liver fluke disease associated with fasciola, is the most important helminth infection in cattle, not in humans. If you want to learn more about liver flukes, I'm including in the description below further learning links. The first group of liver flukes is the fasciola group, which includes your fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. Fasciola hepatica is also known as the sheep liver fluke, while fasciola gigantica is also known as the giant liver fluke. Liver flukes are quite large relative to the other flukes. They can grow up to 7 centimeters long and up to 1.5 centimeters wide. The adult fluke has a very distinct cone-shaped head with prominent shoulders which delineates the anterior portion from the rest of the body. Fasciola hepatica is most commonly seen in parts of Europe, the Middle East, and in the Andean region. Due to its geographic distribution, fasciola hepatica is also called your temperate liver fluke. Fasciola gigantica, on the other hand, is also called your tropical liver fluke, and they are more commonly seen around African regions and Asian regions. In Asia, Fasciola gigantica is commonly seen in China, Vietnam, Korea, India, and Thailand. Here is the life cycle of Fasciola. Infection starts when humans ingest the infective stage called the metacercariae through ingestion of the second intermediate host, your water plants, containing the metacercariae. Existation happens in the duodenum, and once inside the gastrointestinal tract, the metacercariae would release the larva, and the larva will try to seek to find a proper way towards the liver. It does this through penetration of the intestinal wall through the peritoneum until it reaches the liver parenchyma. Inside the liver, it will look for a proper home inside biliary ducts, where maturation usually occurs, and it usually takes around three to four months from ingestion. The lifespan of a mature fasciola is around 9 to 13 years. Once they mature into adulthood, fasciola will release unembryonated eggs into the biliary duct, and these eggs would eventually reach the stools. When the stools are released into the outside environment, the unembryonated egg will embryonate, usually in fresh water, and this takes around 9 to 15 days. Eventually, the embryonated egg will hatch to release the myracidium. The myracidium will look for its first intermediate host, your typical pond snail, wherein it undergoes several stages, like your sporosis, your radiae, your cercaria, which usually takes a few weeks. Eventually, cercaria is released from the snail. And the cercaria will look for its second intermediate host, the water plants, where eventually it will insist into a metacercaria, which completes the life cycle. Aside from humans, Fasciola also undergoes its complete life cycle in cattle and sheep, and sometimes in camels. Let's do a quick quiz. Herbivores are the blank hosts for fasciola. That would be your definitive host. Humans technically are also definitive hosts, but in this case, humans are actually considered as accidental hosts for fasciola. This is because fasciola is still considered a zoonotic disease. Snails, on the other hand, 
would be the first intermediate host. Let me correct this one. And these common pond snails belong to certain species such as Galba truncata, Fossaria, and Pseudosuciné. Water plants, on the other hand, would be considered the second intermediate host for Fasciola. These water plants would include your water cress, sometimes water lilies. But take note that these are fresh water plants. Symptoms associated with fasciolopsis should be categorized into two major phases. The acute phase of fasciolysis revolves around the larval migration that we discussed earlier. Due to the invasive nature of the larva, it elicits a high degree of immunologic response from the human body, which results in vague abdominal pain, fever, sometimes diarrhea, nausea vomiting, eosinophilia, and due to its rampant migration inside the liver parenchyma, it would eventually lead to a bout of hepatomegaly. In fact, high fever, hepatomegaly, and eosinophilia are considered the triad of diagnostic significance as far as fasciolysis is concerned. The chronic phase of fasciolysis refers to the adult stage of the parasite. During this stage, the parasite does nothing more but eat and produce eggs. At this stage, the fasciola adult just resides very quietly inside the biliary tract. And as such, it doesn't really exert much of an immune response from the human body. Therefore, symptoms are more discrete at this point. If there are actually symptoms present, the symptoms would be similar to acute intermittent biliary obstruction symptoms. Adults can cause obstruction, inflammation, fibrosis, or eventually leading to periductal cirrhosis in rare cases. They can cause lithiasis, where in adults and the eggs become nidus or formation of stones. Malabsorption is primarily due to malabsorption of fats and amino acids due to the blockage of bile. And in very, very rare cases, dissemination into the lungs, into the brain and eyes of fasciola eggs can occur. There's a strange case usually seen in the Middle East and parts of Africa called your halzone or marara. This phenomenon is the attachment of live adults to the posterior pharynx, which causes hemorrhagic nasopharyngitis and sometimes dysphagia. This is usually due to ingestion of raw infected liver containing adult worms, not through the ingestion of the metacercaria that we discussed in the life cycle part. Diagnosis for fasciolysis is usually through stool microscopy. You can also look at duodenal and biliary drainage samples, and you try to look for the fasciola eggs. The fasciola eggs are actually among the largest of the helminth eggs that you can see under the microscope. The eggs are ellipsoidal, operculated, so this is the operculum, and relative to, let's say, an ascaris egg, is quite large. If this is your ascaris egg, your fasciola egg is quite noticeably large. Antibody tests can also be used to diagnose fasciola infection and is primarily useful during the acute invasive phase wherein you have a lot of immune reaction from the body. This makes sense. It can also be used in ectopic fasciolysis, can be used to rule out false positives, and it can also be used to diagnose your halzone and marara phenomena. Radiologic tests can also help diagnose fasciolysis. CT scan and sonography can give small clues as to the presence of fasciola. This CT scan demonstrates multiple round clustered hypodense regions in this area, of course. Ultrasound can also demonstrate linear echogenic materials within the common hepatic duct to give you a clue as to the presence of adult fasciola worms. Amongst all the flukes, fasciola is the one which is not susceptible to praziquantel. Apparently, 
Pashola is unresponsive to praziquantel. Therefore, alternative drugs have to be used. The current treatment for human fasciolysis is triclobendazole. Currently, however, it is only registered for human use in Egypt, Ecuador, Venezuela, and France. Bethionol is a far second-line drug, and this is primarily due to availability problems. However, a study by Bitin from Japan puts bethionol as an investigational new drug under the CDC. Prevention and control of human fasciolysis is primarily due to very simple public health strategies, including avoidance of contaminated water, proper washing and cooking of your water plants, sanitation and education, especially those handling your food, and a controversial one would be contaminated liver. Should you avoid liver products? I leave that to you to discuss and debate, but there is a proper answer. Under the One Health Initiative, control of fasciola infections in humans heavily relies in the cooperation of doctors and the veterinarians. Preventive chemotherapy of cattle is one public health measure that can be used to counteract human fasciola infections. Another measure can be the decrease in the use of animal feces as fertilizers. Cultivation of aquatic vegetables veterinary capacity building, and more recently, vaccination in cattle against fasciola are currently on the way, but still in rat models. You may want to Google fasciola hepatica catepsin B2 as the best vaccine candidate for now. And this ends part one of this particular lecture series on liver flukes. I hope you learned something. See you in part two. Thanks for watching. If you learned something, feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.